25 years of experience. Our first panelist, Mohamed Madkur, is a senior expert and executive advisor for Huawei Global Wireless Solutions Organization. His current focus is on overall 5G strategy and improving inclusive connectivity economics globally. As one of Huawei's thought leaders, he represented the company in public and customer events with a record of more than 100 appearances in more than 20 countries in the last three years. Now, courtesy of the virtual platform, he's <laughs> going to visit a lot more. So we say welcome to Mohammed. That's our well, first panelist. Let well, me now move on to introduce panelist number two, Dr. Bruno Soraya, Soraya Nira Economic Consulting. Our second panelist is an associate director in Nearest Communications, Internet and Media Practice based in Madrid and leads the communications, media and internet practice in Europe and Latin America. With over 30 years of experience in the telecommunications and ICT industry, Dr. Bruno Soraya has extensive experience advising companies, trade associations and public administrations throughout Europe, Latin America and Asia on economics, regulation, and the strategy. Dr. Soraya, thank you so much for joining us. We're ro rolling right along to our panelists situated in position number three. Fabian Monge Munio is the head of networks and managed service sales for Latin North America, North and Caribbean at Ericsson. A Costa Rican based in Mexico with more than 15 years experience in the telecommunications and ICT industry, he currently serves as head technical pre-sales for access networks in all its technologies, including 5G, transmission and managed services for LATAM, North and Caribbean region at Ericsson. Welcome, Fabian. <laughs> Thomas Sullivan is our next panelist. Thomas is the chief of the Federal Communications Commission's FCC International Bureau. The International Bureau represents the FCC international conferences and meetings and oversees the licensing and policy activities for international telecommunication services and satellite services. From March of 2010 to January of 2017, Mr. Sullivan served as the Chief of Staff for the International Bureau, where he coordinated international activities within the FCC and advanced the FCC's international represent representation within the U.S. government and at international events. Thank you for joining us, Tom. As we move along and we assemble the panel, we're going to roll and stroll right up to the next person on our panel. Yep. So next joining us on the panel, our final panelist, is Carlos Bosch, head of technology GSMA. Carlos oversees the adoption and implementation of GSMA's technical strategic programs, ensuring that a consistent, interoperable and standardized set of specifications are deployed by mobile operators. During his career, he has been responsible for product development, testing operations and strategy with mobile operators and solution providers. Carlos, welcome. Now that we have the panelists, let me introduce you to a very capable moderator. Mm. Moderating this panel, Mr. Taylor has over 20 years of professional experience, includes management of the Information mm. Systems Unit of Barbados, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade, and its overseas missions. He also previously served between 2010 and 2014 as the Business Development and Operations Manager at the CTU, where he worked with regional governments in the development of policies to govern information and communications technology, ICT, and represent the region in many international ICT conferences. He also led the work to operationalize the CTU's Caribbean Center of Excellence to offer consultancy services to the member states and others. Mr. Taylor, welcome. Welcome to your panel, and I leave the discussion in your capable hands. Thank you very much. I trust everyone can hear me. Thanks for your kind words of introduction. I'm pleased to be um, involved with this very impressive uh, panel that we have lined up here today. And um, uh, we have a very interesting topic, a very topical topic, if I can say that. And we want to thank Kanto for inviting, for inviting us to, to talk about this important subject for the Caribbean. Um, mm -hmm. 
5G, this is, is such a, how 5G can be rolled out in the Caribbean. And this is such an important topic. Uh, 5G, when you consider uh, in terms of the value proposition of high uh, broadband, low latency, um, ultra reliability, and the kinds of projections that we see uh, in terms of the jobs that it will create over 22 million uh, up to 2035 and 10% in terms of global GDP contribution. Uh, all of our panelists, panelists here are much more qualified to speak on this issue. Uh, from the CTU's perspective, we have uh, we coordinate the work of uh, the Spectrum Management Task Force, and this has occupied our discussions. And we know that it is something that uh, if we move together on a harmonized basis in the region, <clears throat> that there will be significant uh, economic benefits for all of us. But without further ado, giving consideration to the time, I'm going to hand over to Mohammed from Huawei, one of the global leaders on this technology, as we all know, to give his presentation on 5G lighting up the future. Over to you, Mohammed. Thank you so much. Uh, so let me let me share. I have a couple, I think, four slides um, uh, I wanted to uh, to present. So first of all, thank you for this warm introduction and for inviting us for this great panel. Uh, of course, we are definitely in 5G era, and uh, you can see that from all of the global 5G deployment uh, everywhere. Uh, currently, we have more than 170 network in, in, in different uh, countries. Uh, of course, of course, Latin America, 5G is not, has not started big in Latin America. Uh, I mean, we have around 15 million 5G users right now, but according to GSME, it's gonna go to up to 62 million uh, uh, in the next five years. But uh, let me tell you that 5G is not about just uh, how many users we are uh, enabling right now or how many sites uh, we are turning on right now. I think 5G user, 5G is about how to get ready for 5G. 5G, it's about uh, how the policies, how the uh, deployment is, is happening uh, and how we are using 5G as well. 5G is not just a technical uh, exercise. 5G, it's about technology. It's about uh, uh, commercial, uh, you know, business. It's about social development. And also it's about economic development globally. Those who are adopting the 5G wanted to move themselves uh, on the ICT leadership map. And if you look at here, you can see that 5G is not on the stage by itself. 5G, cloud computing, artificial intelligence, they are all uh, synergized together to bring value to uh, society. I wanted to mention a quick example here. It is not just about the speed. You can see, for example, in China, 5G is really being deployed and benefiting more than 20 industry, more than 1,000 projects, uh, totaling contract value $1.2 billion. And the operators in China are racking up this kind of revenue only from industry on 5G on industry. It's also social development. You can see for coal mining, reducing 60% of the workers underground and uh, for steel manufacturing, enhancing the productivity by 20% in innovation campus, enhancing efficiency by 10%. By the way, these are not just numbers on slides. That's uh, how the society is benefiting from 5G uh, in China. Uh, when we talk about uh, Latin America, I wanted to mention fixed wireless access because this is one of the great applications that 5G will help. Right now in Latin America, we have about uh, 5 million fixed wireless access, or we call it WTTX, wireless to the X, users in Latin America, supposed to go really up high. It is not just about the revenue or the ARPU from the... Uh, uh, fixed wireless access. It's about connecting the unconnected with really fast time to market with a speed that may exceed fiber speed. I have an example here in front of you from one of our Middle East uh, Middle East operators that so fixed wireless access speed that exceeded uh, fiber speed and they got this uh, price from Okla. And you can see also that how they are racking up users month after month. So what is the secret or how to uh, 
you know, the target for 5G in the Caribbean. It is all about cross-generational experience. You cannot get 5G premium package that will benefit operators and will also benefit the users unless you have cross-generational experience from three times to 10 times compared to 4G. And you can see an example here from one of our South Korean uh, operator, LGU Plus, although they have 20% less spectrum than the other competitors, however, they saw ARPU increased by 30% just after deploying 5G. Why is that? Because of deployment of great technology like Massive MIMO and the cross-generational experience. What are the enabling innovation and what should we target in the Caribbean or any other market? Powerful network, simple and efficient. Powerful by itself is not sufficient because it can be powerful, but it is not simple enough to be deployed easily. And it can be powerful and simple. However, there is high power consumption. There is energy efficiency is not high. Integration efficiency is not high. Spectrum efficiency is not high. So I wanted to focus on the efficiency aspect for 5G, specifically in Latin America, when we talk about green deployment and the carbon footprint. Power consumption and efficiency in 5G, this is one of the, the things that Huawei is focusing on, not only to bring that up to speed or bring the good 5G, but very efficient 5G. For Latin America, I wanted to focus on getting ready for 5G. We have to be very good in 4G. You cannot cultivate good 5G unless you have a great soil of 4G. So why is that? 4G is going to help you on experience consistency, non-standalone deployment. You have to have an anchor in 4G and you have to aggregate 4G and the 5G together. So we always say that every 4G dollar is a 5G dollar investment in 4G right now in the Caribbean. This is the easiest way to lower the investing barrier when it comes to adopting 5G. Doing that right now, it's going to be easy in two years or three years to just turn on the new radio switch, but that's what it takes. Finally, to end up my few words, you cannot do all of that unless we have openness, collaboration between all of the stakeholders. Future looking bold policy, growth oriented policy, how to get all of the stakeholders in one table, no matter industries, vendors, standards, academia, everybody has to come in place to license good spectrum, to understand industry requirements, to cross regulation between industry and telecom. You cannot just focus on regulating telecom. You have to focus on cross regulation. You have to focus on doing a benchmark to, to understand 5G and the security in 5G and all of those current issues. Just to end up my speech, 5G is not just a technical issue or commercial issue or even a social issue. 5G has become a political issue and we need to get rid of that and we need to focus on 5G for society. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Mohammed. Certainly a lot of food for thought. I'm gonna go straight into uh, Bruno right now to talk about the ec economic impacts of 5G on telcos. Is it good or is it bad? Opportunities or what? <laughs> go ahead. Thank, thank you, Ronnie. So, Yes, this is not just about technology. So telecommunications operator need the numbers to add up. And and for this, there are several uh, challenges, but there are also several opportunities that uh, uh, Mohammed has already handled. So if we start uh, with the challenges, first thing we see is from the revenue side, it is not likely that existing customers uh, would like to pay much more just because 5G is faster. So customers are used for speed to increase regularly for the same price. And we don't see there is much opportunity of having existing customers of the connectivity service to pay more. Also, you, you need to engage in sizable investments. You need to buy new spectrum licenses this is a point uh, to, to discuss, which could be the price. You need to, to buy and install new network equipment, and not just replacing 4G or 3G equipment with more powerful equipment, but also building a much denser fiber backbone. And these investments at the time were your 5G deployment still underway. So this is 
uh, a challenge from the side of revenue and from the side of expenditure. However, where is the opportunity for telcos to, to improve their business with, with 5G? I, I would say there are, say, three, three dimensions that can have the maximum impact. First, if the Internet of Things, when you can connect uh, industries and, and devices, so to improve the competitiveness of those industries. I can imagine in the Caribbean, there are opportunities in farming, in tourism, in fintech, in all the industries that are the mainstay of your economies. And also there are the possibility to explore new development opportunities. Given the size of the economies, this is something you need to do with tech partners that have developed uh, their uh, platforms otherwise, but you can uh, think of remote working in, in those lovely places or uh, any other things that uh, your imagination can devise. Second opportunity is fixed broadband. And, and here there is a, a double uh, opportunity, a triple opportunity for you to increase your revenues by deploying broadband in areas where there is no broadband. As Mohammed said, you can deploy solutions that offer fiber speeds uh, mm -hmm. using 5G. You also, if you're a pure mobile operator, have the opportunity to deploy competitive fixed uh, service and uh, compete head on with the incumbent fixed uh, network operator, which uh, was not so easy with the existing uh, mobile generations. And also, if you own a fixed and a mobile network, there is the possibility to get more efficiency in your cost by integrating your core and network and service platforms in the fixed and mobile network, uh, which is something that was much more difficult. Last but not least, it, it, while it's not likely that you can get much more revenue from the existing business, what you can get is uh, <coughs> cheaper capacity uh, to cope with the, traffic, the increase of traffic in the uh, existing business. So that even if you cannot grow your revenues, it uh, there is opportun there are opportunities to uh, lower your your unit costs and and handle the increase of profit in a more cost efficient way. And and then I, I yield the uh, the panel to uh, my colleagues to to discuss this more in detail. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bruno. Um, so you gave us some pros and some cons. Thank you for bringing things in perspective. I'm going to hand over to Fabian to talk about 5G and Industry 4.0 and specifically how that uh, may impact us in the Caribbean. Well, go ahead, Fabian. Thank you, Bradley. Thank you for my colleagues. I think it has been uh, established already that uh, you know 5G is a journey. And um, as Mohammed was rightfully pointing out, we need to have a robust 4G network. And in reality, the Caribbean, according to global data, has around 40% penetration on 4G. So I will encourage, um, you know, to start there, right? To, to make sure that we have a solid base ground so that we can start all the spectrum assets and evolve as we go into a 5G connectivity that will give us the possibilities. Now to, uh, as Bruno was pointed out, pointing out, um, sorry, the, um, amount of use cases and new things that we can bring up into the consumer's table, right? So just to give you a quick grasp of our experience in, in, in terms of our 93 uh, live networks that we have today in, in, in all over the five continents, I think most of the operators will start with um, um, uh, sharing the, the spectrum assets that I mentioned uh, using the 4G layer and evolving into 5G as we go along. So here the important thing is that we need to have a new spectrum in, in, in specifically in mid bands or high bands that will um, enable the operators to actually give and and um, and offer the possibility for performance for new user experience for lower latency and of course to um, have the unmatched 5g experience and unlocking the the real 5g use cases um 
overall in Latin America, and this is a report that we have, and, and I encourage you all to, to log in into ericsson.com and go into um, Ericsson Mobility Report, where we have the trends and and, um, and what we have seen in the technology based on studies and, and statistics. Um, already today, we have 580 million subscri subscriptions in 5G only. And what we expect to have is by 2026, 3.5 billion. Um, one year ago, when we, when we took a picture about Latin America and the Caribbean, we were expecting to have only 13 percent, um, um, let's say, traffic in 5G networks by 2025. And now we see a tremendous growth, mainly because uh, op regulators are, are putting out there and, and, and starting auctioning mid-band and high-band, and then the adoption should be fast. Why this is important? Because the faster we put out there the possibility for 5G and for users to access the 5G, is the faster that we will unlock a new world of possibilities. According to our data, we will see a 7.7 .7 economic growth in by introducing 5G uh, in our region. Uh, we also see a trend for increasing productivity because uh, Bruno was mentioning as well that about uh, different use cases in the industry 4.0. So I think it's only fair to say that the faster we, we, we introduce the technology in the Caribbean, the faster we will try to bridge that uh, technology gap and of course uh, the rural area as also was mentioned by by Mohammed about the fixed wireless access. This is a good um, way of seeing things. Today only one third of use cases are out there for to be purchased in 5G. Of course in the countries where we have launched what we have seen is it's a trend to you know not talking only about connectivity we talk about fixed wireless access. We can talk about 5G television. We can talk about a whole new, a whole new set of use cases that have given operators the possibility for monetizing differently, but also the the end users to start understanding what is really behind 5G. So I think it's important that we explain and educate our end users into what else that can we bring besides connectivity and low latency? So here, you know, the opportunity is there. Two thirds are still within showcase level or R&D. And in reality, in our studies also, 20 to 30% of the consumers are willing to pay extra if we explain them what is it that is that they're going to win with, with 5G. And this is evolving fast. So I think um, the, the faster that we jump into that wave, the faster that we will be able to monetize and to, and to contribute a little bit better into the economies of, of, of the Caribbean. Last but not least, I think um, it has been already established that um, Industry 4.0, it's a key, in, it, it's a, you know, it's, it's, it's key to address. With 12 key industries to address, I think in the Caribbean, um, we can talk about specifics in, in, in uh, Exxon, for example, in, the, in, in chips and in the Caribbean, as well as, as other use cases like vessels and, and ports. Um, there is a huge economy around IoT, around 5G. Uh, we're talking about 3.8 billion US dollars in revenue by 2030. So I think. Um, again, this is in a way how an introduction of a new technology will contribute better into um, the local economies. And of course, uh, let's not forget that roaming might play a big um, role in the Caribbean with tourism being one of the, of the things. Just to close a little bit um, on what has been established, um, I didn't mention COVID, but I think it has started to accelerate the digitalization in most of our countries. Um, also, the fact that fixed wireless access has been a mean to close the digital uh, gap. And I think that is, in, in a way, how we can contribute with a new technology like 5G introduced as fast as possible in our markets. So with that, um, I'll leave you to it. And thank you for your attention and for, for being part of this uh, forum. Thank you very much, Fabian. There's a lot I could ask about that, uh, but I'm going to go in the interest of time over to Tom. I'm sure everyone is keen on hearing what the FCC has to say about 5G. Go ahead, Tom. Thank you very much, Rodney, and thank you to the Kanto organizers again for inviting me to participate this year. It'll be my fourth uh, 
Kanto Annual Conference, and it's such an important topic that we're discussing today, uh, how 5G infrastructure can be rolled out in the Caribbean. From my role as the International Bureau Chief at the FCC, I see many common opportunities as well as challenges that we collectively face when it comes to 5G. Uh, I'd like to highlight a few of those and the ways that we're thinking about 5G in the U.S. that are helping it roll out. The first is with respect to our regulatory philosophy. Um, we believe a light touch regulatory philosophy will help usher in new technologies in general and 5G specifically by not making it too costly for operators to obtain and deploy the necessary infrastructure. Among the concepts that are important here that we promote are technological neutrality. Uh, for example, we don't specify which generation of technology uh, operators must use on specific frequency bands. Uh, we also use consumer choice and transparency as other key factors under that. But a light touch approach does not mean a lack of government action where it is needed. Um, when no rational business incentives exist in the market, it's the FCC's responsibility to step in to encourage and incentivize investment and deployment. And some cases uh, where you see that play out is with respect to our universal service funds, as well as um, steps that we took during COVID uh, to make sure that we had uh, appropriate connectivity. The next area I wanted to quickly uh, sketch out and highlight is with respect to our spectrum management principles and strategies that I believe can help facilitate the next deployment of next generation services. Uh, here, there's uh, three key examples that I think are important. Uh, the first, uh, is what many of my colleagues have already said, is to make additional spectrum available across a variety of bands for both licensed and unlicensed uses. Uh, the second is to consider adopting flexible and technology neutral light touch rules, which I've talked about already. Um, this allows a wide range of technologies and applications, all part of the 5G ecosystem, including uh, fixed mobile, fixed wireless, satellite. Um, this also enables license holders to respond to the rapid pace of technological development and to changing market conditions without having to come back and get regulatory approval. And the final area on spectrum management that I wanted to touch on that could help facilitate deployment is to consider letting the market lead on technological development and the details of implementation. Um, while I'm on spectrum, I do want to uh, quickly note the importance, uh, as others have noted, of mixing the low, mid, and high band spectrum available so that we can meet all of the use cases and including the future use cases of 5G technology. And for regulators, I think it's important to give ample time to stakeholders so they know when these bans are being released. Regionally, I think we've done a great job uh, in our region, ITU region, in terms of harmonizing spectrum. Uh, WARC 19, we saw a tremendous amount of uh, spectrum harmonization, and we look forward to further opportunities for WARC 23. Uh, the next area I just want to briefly touch on is what I'll put under the broad umbrella of public-private partnerships. Um, as our acting chairwoman of the FCC uh, aptly stated, um, I believe that the future belongs to the connected. No matter who you are or where you live, you need access to modern communications to have a fair shot at 21st century success. And of course, nothing demonstrates the importance of connectivity like that, this is like the ongoing pandemic that we're going through. And as a global community, we need these connections, both physical and digital, that strengthen our mutual bonds. Uh, we need communications that reach all of us to, to work, to learn, to be informed uh, and entertained. Uh, and we need connections that can break down the barriers as well that have held too many people back uh, for too long. Uh, here are a couple of things we're doing at the FCC to help address the digital divide. Uh, first, we're implementing some policies to keep our citizens connected during the coronav coronavirus pandemic. Uh, this includes a historic new program called the Emergency Broadband Benefit, uh, where we receive funding to provide uh, in, uh, to provide uh, 
subsidies for families who have low incomes who have lost their jobs, perhaps, uh, so they're eligible for a substantial monthly discount on their internet service. Uh, we've just reached the 4 million household uh, enrollment threshold for that program. And we've also prioritized the basic education needs of children by helping what our chairwoman calls and refers to as the homework gap. Uh, in the US, like most of the world, uh, many of our schools started last academic year with remote learning. Uh, so we expanded our federal subsidy program to connect schools and libraries to broadband to support, to support remote learning. Uh, one area that this played out, we provided the schools with Wi-Fi hotspots, laptops, computers, and other connectivity solutions that were helpful. And um, we're also taking action to better understand where our broadband gaps are in the country by providing more specific uh, areas that need broadband, lack broadband, or are underserved so we can better target our universal service support. Uh, as we've all heard over the past two days, the 5G future is about connecting everything. And by exponentially increasing these connections between the people and the things around us, we're also uh, able to uh, reach tremendous opportunities with manufacturing, agriculture, uh, education, healthcare, transportation, and so much more. This new connectivity, though, also means new vulnerabilities. With so much on the line, it's urgent that trustworthy companies build the next generation networks that will soon touch so many of our lives. And it's critical that we take a multifaceted and strategic approach on this. Uh, in the US, we want companies uh, that are cutting out high risk hardware from their networks to have the opportunity to use trusted alternatives, including traditional end to end proprietary gear, as well as promising newer alternatives like Open RAN. With respect to ORAN, one of our newest national operators will be building out their 5G network using ORAN, and they're hoping to achieve uh, substantial cost savings doing so. Um, at the FCC, for our part, we've initiated a consultation to examine the opportunities as well as the challenges of ORAN. Uh, and just this past month, we held a two-day virtual uh, ORAN showcase that gave network operators an opportunity to hear directly from vendors whose interoperable uh, open interface standards can be utilized for their installations. Um, so these are just some of the ways the FCC has recently taken action to help promote 5G. We're excited about these opportunities and challenges and uh, look forward to working with all of you as we collectively do that. As we're pursuing these efforts in the US, our State Department and Agency for International Development are spearheading efforts to help countries harness the opportunities and meet the challenges. Uh, the program that they have in place to help do this is called the Digital Connectivity and Cybersecurity Partnership. Uh, so please let me know if you're interested in hearing from them. I'd be happy to put anyone uh, who's listening in touch with them. And as I conclude, I just wanted to note, I saw uh, Doreen Bogdan Martin participate this morning. Uh, Bart Doreen is the uh, uh, BDT director at the ID2, uh, at the ITU. And I wanted to congratulate Doreen, uh, who recently convened a very successful Global Symposium for Regulators workshop virtually, which as all of you know who are uh, playing the canto, is no small achievement. Uh, as one of the architects of the GSR, since its inception, uh, I commend Doreen for creating a robust symposium and adapting it to the current uh, circumstances of the global pandemic and helping the ITU deliver timely and relevant material to regulators, industry, operators. Uh, and with such a passion for delivering those targeted and useful programs, uh, we are very excited about Doreen's candidacy for the ITU Secretary General, which will be decided at the ITU plenipotentiary next year. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. Carlos, you have the last word. Uh, I'm going to ask you to compress your 50 slides into two minutes. <laughs> yeah, oh, two minutes. Okay. Well, thank you, Rodney. Hello, everyone. Uh, when we talk about 5G, we talk about IMT 2020, and we talk about 3GPP specification. Now, everybody's deploying around this, but we know that we need this for in an interoperable ecosystem that everybody can participate, but every region has unique requirements, opportunities, and challenges that defines how this network is going to look like. 
I think the Caribbean is not as to this reality and this migration that we're talking about. It will be facilitated by collaboration with, stake with stakeholders, regulatory considerations and economic realities for each island and how they're going to participate. Uh, like it was mentioned before, the 4G paves the way for 5G and we still see that 4G will dominate as 5G is going to be growing and I'm going to be going real fast through this. Uh, another re another thing, another consideration, it will be wider channels. You know, if you allocate 80 to 100 megahertz of continuous spectrum, you will be helping your operators to uh, deploy fewer base stations. And being able to, to, to see that 5G allows you to go beyond what I call beyond connectivity and, and faster data to be able to enable uh, technologies like IoT when you have a massive IoT environment. And beyond speed and latency, keep in mind when we, when, when we have 5G, we're talking virtualization to, to help people have an open architecture and model, network slicing to be able to, to divide the network and segment it, and it's computing if you want to automate factories and so on. And 5G also optimized the communication links and everybody talk about that the initial use case is enhanced um, mobile broadband, but there are many other things that we that, that we see in this triangle that we can do from capacity to massive IoT to low latency. And uh, how GSMA can help you? We can help you with uh, easy interoperability and we have many guidelines that allows you to how, how to move forward. Um, my last two slides, uh, 5G opportunities beyond uh, face wireless can be remote learning. Uh, and we saw a good new cases during the Caribbean summits uh, about this and e-health. Also, you can, you can with, with network slides and you can have an extra layer of uh, and allow public uh, safety to work to work better and be able to, to help in situations of natural disasters. Now, keep in mind that you need, you have the continuity of services that you need to take care of. And as you move to 5G, you either have to rationalize, do I have to work on the evil packet core or I'm going to move to Volti. I think uh, GSMA always have, have said to our members, moving to, to Volti is the right thing and you need to ensure that you have this continuity of services. And 5G is a needed upgrade. Uh, I, I uh, encourage you to download the a GSMA doc, uh, study that we did on the on the socioeconomic benefits of 5G and how 5G can really help your region. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we really are out of time and um, this is a topic that really requires maybe a full week of discussion. It really is a very important and how it can impact our region. You know, there are challenges, there are opportunities and we need overall to ensure that the region is not left behind the rest of the world in terms of this new technology. Uh, I want to thank you for your contribution, but in the interest of time, uh, I don't see any questions in the chat. So I'm going to hand it back over for our host, Mr. Etienne, and thank you so much for all of your contributions to the panel.